Hey there, folks. So, I've got yet another uh, Funny Playing Game Boy Color hardware iteration here. Um, it seems like just yesterday I was doing a video on the 1.0 version of the hardware. But, anyway, here is the the 1.1 version. Um, it should be largely the same as the original. In fact, ugh, I've got a uh, 1.0 here uh, next to me that we can take a look at for comparison. Um, the biggest difference, you'll notice on the 1.1, of course, they got a little bit fancier with the versioning. They replaced the font on the text. For whatever reason, they redid all the button contacts. I didn't even notice that the first time around. Um, but I, I, I didn't see any problems with the old ones. Uh, maybe the new ones are better. I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe it was just a personal taste there. Uh, but anyway, on the front, let's go ahead and compare the differences between these two. Um, actually, you know what? Before I even get into that, let's uh, let's let's cover what all this kit comes with. Uh, so the core, you've got the motherboard of the device itself. You have the screen kit, which is really just a Q5 LCD that has been laminated to a um, a plain black lens, and the border looks something like this. It's nice and thin. You can't, you know, there, there's no logos or anything on it. Uh, there's no power LED cutout. Um, not that they're is a power LED on these things. Uh, but it's nice and plain because there are um, two different options here. Let me, come on. Yeah, that's what I get. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, it does. Uh, so you, you, you've you got the OSD and you can choose between a non-integer full screen scale and then the integer four times scale, which is a little bit smaller. So that's why they give you that thinner border uh, just to you know, let, let you have the option of making it bigger if you wanted to. Um, oh, that's interesting. Anyway, that's for another time. Um, as opposed to like a regular Game Boy Color backlight kit, which is, you know, just the integer scaling. So you have a little bit thicker of a bezel and, and the, um, the logo down here. You don't have the Nintendo logos on this thing. But anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, you also get the battery and, of course, a speaker. To assemble one of these things, you're going to need a few more things. You're going to need some button membranes, some buttons, and, of course, a shell. This thing is designed for a um, customized laminated shell by Funny Playing. The front half of the shell itself is the exact same as their regular uh, laminated Q5 housings, but the back half is a little bit different and it's been customized instead of having that round DC jack down there, uh, it's been customized to accommodate the USB type C port on these things. Otherwise, you know, you, you can cut your own shell to fit if you really want to. I don't recommend it, especially since you can just, you know, grab one of these things and it, it just works. You just gotta assemble it, that's it. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I've got a little bit later. I've got something special here, uh, but anyway, that's what this comes with. So let's go ahead and go over these boards like I wanted to now. Um, like I said, the fronts are pretty much the same aside from the difference in font and button contacts and the label, of course. The only real difference on the front is on the original version, you had these two wimpy little LEDs. And on this version, you have a few more components and then an RGB LED down here. Uh, if we flip it over to the back, that's where things are a little bit more interesting. Um, the majority of the core components up on the top half are identical, with one exception. On the new version, there is a dedicated crystal oscillator. The old version used an internal clock generator in the FPGA. The new version uses an external one, and they've, of course, stopped etching the markings off these chips. I don't know why they ever bothered in the first place, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, of course, all the power supply is the same. Um, all of this nonsense over here is the same. Uh, the difference is they've taken away the component labels on the board. Uh, whereas the old version, you know, you could, you could look at this and go, oh yeah, that's C2. Whereas on this one, nothing's there. Oh, those capacitors are in a different spot too. Just notice that. Anyway, um, the IR blaster and receiver are still unpopulated, um, but Otherwise, you know, it's largely the same up here. 
down here, same same deal, largely the same. This half of the board is basically identical. Um, well, no, I'm noticing slightly different layout of some of the parts. I, I don't know what all this does, but I do know they have a different battery charging IC in here. Um, I've speculated that this means, you know, maybe it can charge a little bit faster. We'll prove that later. Uh, see what actually happens with the charging. I know that um, I know they've changed out the charging in uh, the charge indicator because they changed out the charge I see as well. Um, but otherwise, I think that's about it. So one thing that I know that is different about this new one compared to the old one is because of the addition of this external clock reference, it should be don't quote me on this, but it should be a little bit more accurate as far as timings go compared to an original Game Boy Color. Not that the old one was inaccurate, but it was measurably faster or slower depending on your your um, your overclock settings. Um, no more so than like a Super Game Boy was a little bit too fast. You know, this is this is right online with that. Uh, you could still do multiplayer between that and a regular Game Boy Color, and it was close enough that it didn't usually cause any conflicts. I'm sure if you were playing for like half an hour or more, the, the timing might start adding up, but who, who's doing that? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I guess let's go ahead and get this assembled. Um, ooh, there is one more change that I have speculated, and I do actually have a computer on standby here to test this out but I believe they have updated the firmware on this microcontroller to allow updates from more than just Windows machines. We'll test that out later. Uh, first, let's go ahead and start testing this thing out. Um, I already have everything I need to test it. I just really wanna make sure that this screen works and is undamaged um, and that the console itself you know, works and is undamaged. We'll, we'll test actual gameplay later, but once we've got it a little bit more assembled. But to test it out, we can just plug this bad boy in here. And I'm going to be holding that to insulate it, but first I need to switch that off and plug in my battery here. Oh. And then with that plugged in, I'm just holding the screen to make sure it doesn't short on these um, cartridge pins back here. And I'm just going to switch it on and see what happens. Comes right on. Uh, there's a logo. It's trying to load something. I don't know what it's trying to load, but it freezes after trying to load. Let me actually plug it in a test cart here. Because I've noticed the OSD stops if these things get... Uh, if they, if they try and load a game and fail. Um, so it's coming by default with the X4 scaling set instead of the full screen, which means it is gonna have integer scaling and you can swap out to like one of these laminated um, screens with the logo. If you use one of the funny playing Q5 screens, the logo itself is not gonna be illuminated. Uh, so this is gonna look basically like it does when it's off where there's no logo, except always. Uh, there are some AliExpress sellers that have um, Q5 LCDs laminated to a lens with a printed logo. Uh, if you want to use that, it's just drop in. It just means you won't be able to use the full screen option anymore. But if you don't care about that, then, well, doesn't matter. It's in the exact same place location-wise. I'm seeing this one came with V1.02 firmware installed. Uh, when these things, when the V1.1 hardware first started shipping, it looked like they were coming with V0.9. I don't know what the difference is between those two versions, except that this one has that boot screen. But anyway, we know it's working enough to continue with the assembly, so that's exactly what I'm going to go ahead and do. Flip that over, try and unplug this. I really do dislike this connector, because they're quite delicate, but... There we go. If I 
pry it up from the bottom instead of pulling on the wires. It should preserve it a little bit better. And let's get that disconnected there. And uh, let's go ahead with assembly. I totally forgot to test the speaker. I should have tested the speaker. Um, you'll get a chime on boot up. I don't know if these things work without the uh, without the screen on there. Um, we're just gonna assume it works for the sake of the video, but please plug in your speaker beforehand and test it. Uh, but otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and assemble it. I have two choices for shells here. Um, I'm really liking this shell, but I'm thinking maybe it's not for this project. Um, I'll, I'll save it for something a little bit later. This is a, a custom from Retro Gamer Pair Shop designed by uh, one of their employees, and I, I think it's sick. Even if the game, the design it's based on was, you know, a little mediocre, they at least got the aesthetic right, you know? I, I, I love it. I'm so excited to use it. I, I don't know what for. It'll, it'll match my Xbox controller at the very least. Uh, but, but this is the one that we're using. Um, if you haven't seen this shell before, that's because it hasn't been a sale, hasn't been available for sale before. Uh, also custom from Retro Game Repair Shop. Um, I will go ahead and link it in the description. It should be going up for sale right about the time this video goes up. So um, if you're interested in something like this, well, they're offering UV printed custom shells for the funny playing consoles now. And even if you wanted one beforehand, you, you still could have gotten one where you just buy the UV printed shell and then buy the funny playing shell as well. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's the same front. It's just the back that's different. So you just use the back from the funny playing one and the front from the UV printed one. And it all works out the same. But anyway, let's continue. So, first thing, I'm going to go ahead and install this. I've got some custom buttons here from Retro CNC that I really want to use. Um, I used custom buttons in my last one from Retro CNC, except that these custom buttons were custom for me, whereas these are the actual <laughs> retail, uh, retail buttons. They look a little bit different with the um, engraving on the button itself and they're convex instead of being concave. Uh, the D-pad has the arrows on it, etc. Um, I really like the effect because they're anodized and then the labeling is cut out on a separate operation. So it really stands out from the text, but or from the background. I think it's neat. Uh, I will go ahead and link those in the description as well. Of course, you don't need these. Uh, you can just use regular buttons if you want. There's zero reason you have to use metal ones. I just like them. Uh, a. Uh, but one of the things that I like especially about the retro CNC buttons is they make metal start and select. Now, if you're familiar with the Game Boy Color, you know that the start and select are usually made of silicon. Well, that's a little bit different here. Um, so how we install these is you have to take the regular silicone membrane and then just cut the top of the button off. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is I'm just lining it up to try and eyeball how much I need to cut. And then I'm gonna come back and cut off the button. Just like that. And you can use OEM membranes for this if you want, but if you're building one of these things, chances are you're not using OEM membranes and you're using all aftermarket parts, but that's okay. Just drop those in there, drop the membrane over it. Install all my membranes here. I'm just gonna dry fit that right now so I can flip it over and take, oh yeah. 
yeah, I'm good with that. I think the uh, purple was a good choice with this shell color. And the gunmetal buttons. Alright. Before continuing, however, we do need to install the speaker. So these consoles use a bit of an upgraded speaker compared to the OEM Game Boy. Um, I don't know the specs on this thing, but I know it pumps out a lot more noise. Um, like sound, not random noise. Um, it sounds a lot better, I think. I'm going to install it, might as well with the logo facing down. These things used to come with a little uh, silicone um, boot to slip them in. I don't know if mine didn't or if they've just stopped shipping those. But I've got two kits on hand just in case and yep, go figure. Mine was missing that boot. That's unfortunate. But that's okay. So if you're missing the boot, I'd recommend contacting support, um, unless you're me and you just have an extra kit laying around. But the boot goes over the speaker like that, and then you can drop it in to the shell, just like that. And the boot helps hold the speaker nice in place so it doesn't rattle around and make extraneous noise. Uh, we'll go ahead and install the board here. Uh, oh. Looks like the speaker has to be at an angle to clear properly. That's unfortunate, but it is what it is if you care about the logo. Size bit. Oh, there we go. That's so much better. Screw that in. The other short Phillips screw goes in here. And because we're screwing metal into plastic, this does not need to be tight. Just screw it down so that it's snug and then back it up, quarter of a turn just like that, and I think you'll be happy with the uh, fit and finish there. Uh, there is one more screw hole right in the middle here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this one, not because I need to, but uh, because on some of the older shell variants, this is not one of them. Uh, you see there's this little cutout in the battery compartment here where the head of the screw is supposed to fit. That's fine. I'd prefer they just drill this out entirely, but it's not a through hole. Um, on the earlier variants of this shell, there was not a cutout there, and um, it put unnecessary force on the screw and could cause these shells to crack. Uh, but as it turns out, you don't need that screw whatsoever anyway. I believe the point of it is to add a little... Ooh, that's unfortunate. I just noticed that. Um, oh, well. It's not gonna affect anything. Um, I believe the purpose of that screw is just to add a little bit more stiffness so that the buttons are a little bit more responsive, but it's, it's not necessary. Um, you can totally skip it. And the reason I recommend you skip it too is because if you over tighten this or under tighten it, if it's not perfectly tightened, um, you're gonna have basically the same problem where it causes a crack right in the front of the shell and we. We just don't want that. So since it's unnecessary, let's just skip it entirely. Uh, so next I need to go ahead and plug in the speaker. There was this little plug in there. Um, the purpose of this plug is these boards are assembled with a little pick and place machine. So this plug provides a flat surface for this part to be installed. Um, 
you don't need it. Just pull it out, toss it, do whatever you want with it. Um, and then we'll plug the speaker in. Maybe. There we go. Just a little toy. And I just want to tuck the wires in so that they're not getting pinched by anything when I continue assembly, just like that. And I keep doing this. I keep getting buttons set aside for this thing and then I don't have a power switch. Uh, I'm gonna install the IR window. I have no idea where that came from. It was just on my desk. <laughs> uh, and I think I have a power switch just on my desk too. Because of who I am as a person. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, never mind. But I'm sure there's one in here. How am I missing power switches? I have a clear one. Oh. It was on my desk, it was just underneath all the little button baggies. size indeed it is and these funny playing shells I think it's a little silly that they're still coming with the uh, tri point screw oops yeah tri point screws instead of just all Phillips at this point, but at least they've resized the bit so that it's the same size as um, the OEM Game Boy consoles that it's based off of. Whoops. Same deal, because we're doing metal into plastic, I'm just gonna bottom this bad boy out and then back it up quarter turn. Bottomed out, back a quarter. Bottomed out, back a quarter. Bottomed out and back a quarter. and back a quarter and bottom down and back a quarter and just like that we're almost there go ahead and install the screen next because I already tested this I'm confident we should have no issues at least nothing with the screen get this adhesive off, or the paper backing rather. There should be no insulation necessary for this sort of thing. Um, it is possible to make contact with those pins with this screen if you're not being careful, but once it's installed, it's not going anywhere. So just, you know, leave the battery out while you're doing this and there should be no issues. It is a lot easier to install the screen with the motherboard already installed, but obviously that only works the first time. So we can get that connected and then just slip it into the housing, just like that. 
And last but not least is our battery here. Get that connector lined up and then press it in with my spudger. This is not actually the easiest thing to reach otherwise. Uh, don't use tweezers for this step. That's just kind of silly. Um, they can short and that's bad. Oh, that is a lot tighter than it used to be. I guess funny playing is using new batteries. We'll tuck that additional wire in there. My shell did not come with any battery terminals on this side. If yours does, remove them before installing this battery. Um, from there, I guess that's pretty good. On the older models, uh, the battery wasn't tight enough to, to kind of press fit. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that yet, but the plus side is that it doesn't rattle in the housing. The older ones did. Um, so on the older ones, I would put a little bit of foam on here that would uh, press up right against the battery door and snug the battery in place. That does not appear necessary here, but if it makes you feel any better, um, it's not like yours won't be coming with bubble wrap that you can use. Otherwise, any foam should work, I guess. Um, but that should be it. And my speaker works, that's good. <laughs> All right, so first let's do my test cart. All my buttons are working, so that's good. Um, if those are working, everything else should be working too, um, especially since it's booting games. We could do some more tests, but I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that it works because so far everything seems to work. Uh, so let's go into the OSD, which you achieve by just a quick press on the volume wheel. That actually, that will press into the side of the console. It's no longer just a wheel, but a rotary encoder that has up, down, and press. And once you get into the menu, you have a litany of options here. Um, more specifically, you can control the backlight brightness. Uh, you can control the volume from here, though. Um, you'll want to hit save after changing anything. You can also control the volume just by pressing up or down on this wheel. Uh, next, we have the display options, which by default, we only have three. We have the X4 integer scaling, which puts a little bit of a black border on, around the edges before the bezel. We have the X4 integer scaling with a pixel grid. This is my least favorite option, I think because it reduces the effective brightness of the screen, which means you're gonna want more backlight brightness to compensate, which means it takes more power. And just in general, I don't think it looks good, but that's subjective. If you like it, you know, by all means. And then last is the full screen option, which on this specific console is probably my favorite. Um, if you look, you will find scaling artifacts, um, artifacts of uneven scaling, uh, especially with certain text. You might find that the space between letters is a little bit inconsistent. Um, this is not the best example because this is actually looking fantastic. But if you're playing a text heavy game, something like an RPG, uh, I, I don't know, maybe Pokemon, which there we go, it's in that one. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll probably notice it a little bit more in there, but it's one of those things where if you look for it, you'll find issues. But as long as you're happy with how it works, then it's, it's fine. Um, I'm happy with how it works, and yes, I know if I look for it, I'll find issues. But we're just gonna not look for issues and that'll be fine. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Uh, next, we have the core option. We have two options here. By default, it's on GBC, but we can also change it to GB. When you change cores, you need to save and then reset. And you notice it reboots. Um, that was a little bit glitchy. 
Let's try that again. There we go. It reboots, and this time it's running in Game Boy mode instead of Game Boy Color. But because now it's running in Game Boy mode instead of Game Boy Color, we have option to all of the screen palettes, all of the color palettes. Uh, so this means games are only gonna be running in four colors, black, white, light gray, and dark gray, just like on the original Game Boy. And it also means you cannot run any Game Boy Color games in this mode. That does not mean you can't run Game Boy Color games because technically this is a Game Boy Color game, um, but it's also Game Boy compatible. So we can run that as if it were an original Game Boy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's definitely not my save. Huh? Huh? But we can also... I said we can also... There we go. Uh, we'll go ahead and set that back onto GBC mode and reset it. See, we get the Game Boy Color boot screen. And now everything should be in color. Or at least, you know, as a Game Boy Color would have colored it. <laughs> We'll come in here, and now you notice eh, it's in color, but some of my sprites are a little bit messed up. So we'll go back into the OSD, and we'll change this GBC display option to GB, and then save. And now my sprites look good. And you can play games like this. So I've noticed compatibility with certain games is not 100%. Um, I found that original Game Boy games, you know, the gray carts, I have one, I could have just grabbed one. Original Game Boy games in these gray carts tend to work better in the Game Boy Core instead of the Game Boy Color Core. Um, I don't know if that's true for this new version, but it is at least true for the older version. There are exceptions. Some games work perfectly fine in both. But in general, I've found that Game Boy games work better in the Game Boy Core. And then Game Boy Color games... <gasps> I don't have one! How can I not have one handy? I'm literally sitting next to a bucket of games. Ugh. Yeah, there we go. Game Boy Color games in these clear smoke cartridges with the uh, hump on them. These, of course, required the Game Boy Color Core. Um, so it, it's, it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, if you're playing an original Game Boy game, or I guess this is technically a Game Boy Color game, if you're playing a Game Boy Color game that has full Game Boy compatibility, um, you can probably run it in the Game Boy Color core, but you'll have to change the GBC display option to GB. Uh, otherwise, you might get some weird glitches like the... Um, palettes being half black in Pokemon Red. I don't know what's up with that. I don't know why it works that way. It just does. I don't understand what's going on in the background that uh, changes that, but it is what it is. Oh, it even broke the animations. I didn't realize that. That's fascinating. Um, anyway, last two options here. We have frame mix on and off. Uh, if you're familiar with the funny playing Game Boy Color backlight kits, that is the FRM feature or uh, frame blending. And what it does, uh, you know what, let's see if I can't just show you a demo here. Let's see if the EverDrive works. Um, so I've been over this spiel dozens of times. Um, the original Game Boy did not have a way of doing transparency. However, the pixel response time on the screens in the original Game Boy was absolutely terrible. Uh, so devs figured out a neat little trick that you can do to um, take advantage of that second fact to simulate the first feature in that, uh, ooh, that's interesting. Damn it, I had the wrong option. Okay, let's 
See what I mean? You got to change that uh, display option sometimes. Um, so to simulate that, they would flicker a sprite on and off real quick, and the original screen had no way of refreshing the pixels that quick, um, so it would result in a nice transparency effect. Uh, I'm told that in Legend of Zelda specifically, they do that not because of the transparency, but because there is a sprite limit. You can only have so many sprites on the screen at the same time. Um, something, something, memory. I, I don't understand the technical details. I'm not a, I'm not a programmer, but I don't know. It's, it's just a hard-coded thing. There's only so much memory, and that's what you got to do. But by alternating which sprite is shown, you might notice if you pause this video, um, if I have frame mixing off, you might notice if, a, if you pause this video that each of the chain links are alternating. Uh, they do that to double the sprite limit. Of course, it means that the sprites are then transparent, but instead of 32 or whatever, now you've got 64 to work with. Uh, but anyway, this is what frame mixing does. With that off, you see there's a little bit of flicker, but if I turn that back on, it's nice and smooth with no flicker. That's all it's doing. It's just reducing the flicker. Uh, unfortunately, it means just by nature of how it works, there might be a little bit more lag because it has to use the data from two separate frames instead of just passing one frame into the screen buffer and then passing the next frame and so on. But in practice, I have not noticed any, any issues whatsoever, any additional lag, nothing. In fact, it is theoretically possible that this feature implemented in this console has less lag compared to the feature implemented in this console. Because of how this is implemented, it means we can do the calculation on the CPU itself instead of doing the calculation on the frames that the CPU spits out. I think that's pretty neat. I haven't actually tested it, so that's only a, it's, it's only theoretical at this point, um, but we'll I'll, I'll have to test that out at some point. Either way, that's what frame mixing does. Uh, if you have games like Zass, I usually test with that one. That seems to um, make or break that game, basically. I don't know if I have it on here. I probably do, but I don't think I want to find it. Never mind. Uh, it starts with a C, even though it's called Zass because the full name is that. <laughs> there we go. I do have it on here, I lied. Uh, I think this is one of the weird games, yeah. This game only works in the Game Boy Core, so we're gonna have to save and reset that. Oh, that's interesting. But all right. I, I see the Game Boy Core is not fully compatible with the flash cart, so... Well, there you go. <laughs> There's still some compatibility issues. We'll circle back to this. Maybe an update will fix it, uh, because I'm not on the most current firmware here. Uh, so on that note, let's go into the next thing. Um, oh, there is one more option I didn't cover, but we'll, we'll circle back. Uh, so one of the new features with this hardware version is that, in theory, it should be updatable with anything anything that does USB mass storage. So I've got this MacBook here that i got to sign into. All right. Eh, eh, eh. All right, forgive me, I'm gonna hold this at a kind of weird angle because I don't really have this sort of thing set up. Uh, but if you go onto Funny Playing's website here and you scroll down, they have several links here. The first link for the V1.06 hardware goes to my GitHub repository, which also has the V1.1 hardware firmware. Um, but also they have direct links to the V1.1 firmware if you want it. Um, that's the exact same thing that I have in my repository here. I will go ahead and link this down in the description, uh, but it's just my GitHub and then gwgbc underscore firmware. 
Uh, I called it that because that was Funny Playing's code name for the device, and I just never renamed the repository. Um, but anyway, you see there are two different versions here. You scroll down, you can you can pick which version you have based on the picture. I'm probably gonna update this picture. Um, no offense, you know who you are, but I, I I can just take a picture so that they match lighting and, and layout and whatnot. But anyway, uh, this is 1.1, so we'll click on that. And then there are several different versions of the firmware at this point. I'm gonna choose the latest one, which, ugh, of course, there's still a typo, uh, <laughs> which is version 1.04, but it was compiled on the 25th here. Um, you just click update.bin and then you click raw and it'll download, but I already have it downloaded here. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in. Unplug a cart if you have one, just in case. Switch it on. And you should see, let me get rid of this guy, a drive pop up. I'm gonna go ahead and move this into frame here so you can see what's going on. Uh, and then I'm gonna click and drag my, oh, no I'm not. Click and drag, oh, nope. Sorry, I'm not a Mac power user. Click and drag update.bin over to my drive. Ugh, oh, good lord. Does it work better here? I'm gonna control C and control V that over to my drive. <laughs> and it should go ahead and copy. And then once that is done copying, You'll notice my screen shut off. It should update. And ta-da! It's updated, and it's working on Mac. How neat is that? Uh, so the original 1.0 hardware, you, you couldn't do this on Mac. It would just, it would break the device, uh, and then you'd have to go back and try re-updating from Windows. But it works nicely here. We'll go ahead and eject that, because otherwise the computer's gonna complain. And I'll go ahead and unplug that, and yeah, it complained anyway. But whatever, it is what it is. It works on Mac now. If you have a V1.0 device and you want to update it, um, a Windows PC is required. Uh, but that also includes this. You, you can update from one of these if you have one. Um, though if you still have one and you're still actually using a Windows phone, um, I'm sorry guys, but it's been eight years. It's time to give up. <laughs> but it does work for updating. It still counts. <laughs> um, but anyway, one of the new things with this version, uh, and of course, you have to boot it with a game in, otherwise it freezes and the OSD stops working still. Okay, let's switch cores then. Wait, V0.89, <gasps> I installed the wrong firmware. Okay, it, it does work, you saw that it works, but I installed the wrong firmware. I didn't have the right stuff downloaded. So let's, let's try that again. Downloads. And we get to watch me struggle. Delete. How do I delete? Move to trash, that's what I want. We'll go into Safari. You know what, maybe I just copied the wrong file. I will fix my repository after this, but let's just download it from Funny. That is what happens when you flash the wrong firmware. I can't open a 7Z on this, can I? Oh, I can, how convenient. Command C. Plug that back in. Command 
Baby. Ta-da! Now it's booting. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll fix that later <laughs> after this video here. Um, oh, that's neat. Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna corrupt anything. I'm just gonna yank it. And now it's booting game. <laughs> anyway, the menu's a little bit different. They swapped out the font. I'm not 100% sure why they did so, uh, but they also tried making the background a little bit transparent. And I mean, I guess it works, but it's kind of distracting uh, because it's hard to read if there's text behind it, um, which in my case there is, but all of the options are the exact same. You've got the three display modes, you've got the two cores, you've got the palettes here, uh, you've got frame mix, you've got the, oh, now they call it GB color fix, um, on or off, that doesn't do anything in GB mode, but you have to be in GBC mode. And then the last option I'd never went over is speed, speed. Uh, I'm going to set that back into Game Boy Color mode and power that off. And we'll switch back to the flash cart here. Oh, that's a better boot screen than it was. I think it's better at least. I think it could still use... Um, some optimization, as Funny Playing would say, but that's okay. Um, allegedly, compatibility with this flash cart should be fixed, but I'm not so sure I would rely on that. Uh, GB test ROMs, let's try the 240p test suite. Because we want to go into this stopwatch and um, you know, my, my phone's recording at normal time. This looks to be about normal time, but it's hard to tell. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, but last option here is an overclock option. It should bring us up to 1.25 speed instead of one. Um, I don't know. You'll have to try and time the video based off of these settings if you want to figure out exactly what it is. I I don't know. That's it's definitely overclocked. That's still overclocked. I don't know. That looks about normal. I don't know. So does that. <laughs> okay, that definitely looks slow though. And that's about as slow as it go, as slow as it goes. So it doesn't doesn't really go down to half speed. Um, I suppose it might be nice if you're into that sort of thing, but I, I'm personally not really a fan of overclocking. I get the appeal, but it ain't for me. Um, I think I think running on stockish speeds for now should be good. Uh, I haven't timed this. I don't know. I'll have to compare the footage afterwards and see, but I know as of 1.02, um, it was still a little bit too fast or a little bit too slow, depending on which setting you had. Maybe this looks about right. I don't know. My sense of timing isn't that keen. I can't tell you um, how off it is. I'd, I'd have to put this side by side, a regular Game Boy Color run in the same thing and, you know, check it after a few minutes and see which runs, which one, if any, is running faster. Uh, but I will, I'll do that off, off screen later because I don't want to, this video is already way too long. Um, and last thing, but certainly not least, is a new feature that is, is kind of undocumented. If you go through my 
firmware repository and you're looking at the firmware for the old hardware, it's in there. But if you press and hold the wheel, it should put the console to sleep. So it's super hard to tell because the backlight is off. But if you have one of these in person, uh, in hand, you can uh, sort of kind of see that the screen is still on, uh, but the core itself is paused. So the game's still there. Uh, you can sort of kind of see the stopwatch outline as I'm waving this around, um, or at least the, the numbers there. I can see it a lot better in person than it's coming out on camera. Sorry about that. I don't know how to fix that. Um, but it does pause the game. Unfortunately, it does not save very much power. Uh, I guess it's a good option for games that aren't pausable. I also don't like that there's zero indication that this console is on aside from the power switch being on. Uh, I think like a little a little blink and light or something would be nice, but just press and hold to bring it back up. And on real games, it tends to work fine. I guess not so much on a flash cart, but we can try that on a real game, no problem. I'll even turn the volume up here. And my palettes are glitched, but that doesn't matter for the point of this demo. I'm gonna go ahead and sleep it. The game's still running, you can see. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter how long I let this sleep. Uh, but that being said, the battery life on this thing seems to be about four to six hours. Um, so in sleep, it seems to last about six to eight hours. So obviously you don't want to put it to sleep longer than that or the battery will die. But to wake it, you just press and hold again and it should just come back up. And as you can tell, it works a lot better with original carts than it does with um, something like an SD based flash cart here. Uh, but it should also work totally fine with da, 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 da. oh there's my zas cart it should also work with these modified um like hdr carts or the original carts that are converted to flash carts should work no problem with those uh, hopefully the compatibility is increased with this newer version. Ooh, I forgot that was on here. Obviously I didn't get very far. Um, actually, you know what? There is one thing that was not working. Let's try it out. So I know the Game Boy Core is a little hit and miss with this thing, but it was an easy flash, not this one. I don't know if they fixed Easy Flash compatibility. The change log only says something about EverDrives. Let's try Crystal Clear. Because that was never booting for me on a flash cart with, on this thing. Yeah, and it's still not booting for me. It just goes to a white screen. And just to ensure that I am not totally insane, let's try it on a regular Game Boy Color. Some games do work. Yeah. I didn't think it was a ROM issue. But um, yeah. Obviously, compatibility with these things is still not 100%, so if you're buying one of these to use with one of these, or one of these, you're gonna be disappointed. That's still the scenario. Um, Funny Playing says they're working on it, but it's still not fixed yet. So I, I just, if that's what you want, this is not the device for you. I'd recommend something like, I don't know, an emulator console. You'll have a much better experience uh, rather than using an emulated Game Boy with an emulated cartridge, you know what I mean? Um, it's just, these things both have level shifters in it. You've got level shifters on this side of the interface and then level shifters on the other side of the interface. Eh, eh, eh. 
uh, it's just, it, it causes issues. There's something about the, the timings that it just doesn't work out with the Game Boy bus speed. Not that these things are particularly high speed, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> the latency has to be dead on, otherwise it doesn't work. And it just is what it is. Um, but otherwise, you know, if, if you have Game Boy hardware, you want to use your original carts with something like this, this is a super cool way to do it. I don't think that this will replace an actual Game Boy, at least not yet. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe a few more firmware updates down the line will be good, but today is not that day, not yet. But uh, you know, if you want a if you want a Tetris machine, or I guess a Kirby machine, it do work. Anyway, that's about all I've got. Um, big shout out to Retro Game Repair Shop for providing this stuff for me to for me to play with. Um, they provided the buttons, the shell, and the kit itself. They provided basically everything on this table. Um, these things, at least. The games are mine. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go ahead and link to this stuff down in the description if you want to check it out. Um, otherwise, you can always grab these things direct from Funny Playing, at least the hardware. You can't get the UV printed shells or these, these fancy retro CNC buttons. Um, but if you don't mind a little bit of longer wait on shipping time and if you need support having to go through funny playing, then uh, by all means, uh, you know who you are. But otherwise, I've got links in the description. Um, Retro Game Repair Shop has always been super good to me about this kind of stuff. And um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I'm into it. I think this thing is super neat. I, I, really, I really like the idea of having like full aftermarket hardware because this is cool, yeah? But they only made so many of them and they're all at least 20 years old at this point. Um, shoot, this came out in 1998, so they probably would have stopped making them in 2001 when the Game Boy Advance came out. So these are all probably about 25 years old. <laughs> Um, and anyone who's my age knows that things stop being as reliable when they get that old. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to attack everyone here, um, but it is what it is. Anyway, I, I, I think having replacement hardware is super cool. Even if it's not 100% there yet, um, there are companies out there that prove it's absolutely possible to do something like this, and, um... This is not that thing. This is only for carts. There's no, you can't load any additional cores. There's no SD card support or nothing like that. So don't, don't, don't equate the two. They're, they're not exactly the same product for the same niche, even though the base functionality that this thing does, that thing also does. Um, but I think it's super cool that this stuff is out there. I am, I'm, I'm excited to see the future of mods for this sort of thing. I personally believe that Game Boy modding has kind of reached the, the peak of what's possible and anything further from here on out is basically software. Um, you can only do so much with the original hardware. You know, you can only take it so far until you're, you're adapting, you know, the, the IO on every little thing on it. Whereas if you take one of these, you put the whole thing in software and you can modify whatever you want. Like earlier when I mentioned that it's possible this thing has less input lag than a real Game Boy, that's actually a thing. It's possible, it's entirely possible because when you think about it, the screen buffer for this thing is running on the CPU. Whereas this one with an original Game Boy Color CPU the screen buffer is feeding another FPGA that is then feeding this screen. By nature of electronics, this thing does have more lag than this thing is possible. Um, 
there, there's just more steps in the chain. It's the exact same end result. You know, you've still got the Q5 LCD. It's the exact same LCD in both of these. So just, just by nature of the adapter chain, it's possible for something like this to be even better at playing the original games than this one is. We're not there yet, but it's possible. You, you, you catch my drift? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm super excited about it. I'm, I'm eager to see where this leads. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and I, I, I need to wrap it up here. I think I've covered everything I need to cover. Um, links in the description. Um, make sure you read through my GitHub repository on firmware if you have any questions about uh, this thing. I have put some notes in there as far as what Funny Playing has planned for the future of this device. As far as I know, um, Funny Playing is not the most communicative with me, especially. Um, so sometimes things change and they don't tell me. Like, for example, this thing launched. It was a surprise to me, too. Uh, both the original hardware and the update, um, updated hardware, the V1.1. Oh my god, I totally forgot to test charging. Oh, okay. Let's plug that in there and see what happens here. Okay, so this bad boy is already charging at a higher rate. Uh, it's at 5 volts, it's pulling about 900 milliamps, which means it should charge twice as fast as the original hardware here. Let me plug in the original one just for comparison. You can see that one pulls 5 volts, 450 milliamps, so it, it's literally double. Um, not that I think this one charges slow, but I don't know, faster charging is always nice. If you don't like that it charges faster, you can always just plug it into a charger that doesn't put out one amp. Um, I have a 90 watt charger on the other end of that cable, so it'll charge just about anything I plug into it. Uh, but you know, if you only have a two and a half watt charger, it'll only charge at two and a half watts. Um, so that's <laughs> myth busted, I guess, or confirmed, however that works. Um, Anyway, I got to go edit my repository because I have plenty of new information and I need to correct the firmware that is in there. <laughs> um, sorry if you are one of the people who downloaded the wrong firmware and then had to go fetch the correct firmware. Um, my bad. <laughs> uh, at least nothing's bricked, you know, you could just reflash it with the, with the new stuff. Um, but now that I have a 1.1 device, I can actually test that when I upload them. So anyway, uh, I got to end it here. Thanks for watching. Um, this stuff is super cool. I'm, I'm so excited for the future of this stuff. Um, oh, one more thing before I go. Funny Playing did mention that they have very, very many plans for this thing. Uh, wow, that was, that was terrible grammatically. I'm so sorry about that. To everyone I just offended. <laughs> um... Funny Playing has mentioned that they are working on a Game Boy Advance version of this thing. I don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it took another two and a half to three years before that comes out, but it is what it is. They've also mentioned that they plan on adding SD card support. I don't know for what, but presumably for loading up uh, ROMs that way. Again, well off in the future. That's not coming until we get the Game Boy Advance version. Um, they have also mentioned that they plan on taking this specific core that is in this device and making it in Game Boy Pocket and original Game Boy form factors so that if you prefer this form factor over the Game Boy Color, then, well, you'll be set. Um, or if you prefer the original Game Boy, but I don't have one on hand because original Game Boys suck. Um, that's a thing, too. I'm sorry, I'm pausing because I just looked down and found an original Game Boy. I do have one in hand. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's coming probably a lot sooner than the Game Boy Advance one because electrically they should be identical. Um, they just need to revise the form factor to physically fit and then presumably make uh, housings for them. I, I don't know how long that's going to take, but I'm guessing that'll probably be sometime this year. Um, but don't quote me. That's just what Funny Playing told me. 
We'll have to wait and see what they actually do. They've also mentioned that they plan on adding um, some more features, and I have all that documented in, in the GitHub repo. If you're one of those people who has purchased the V1.0 hardware, Funny Playing has said they will continue to support it, but given the, given the timing differences between these two, I don't know how much longer they plan on supporting the 1.0 hardware. Um, I'm sorry you paid the early adopter tax, but it is what it is. Um, maybe reach out to who you purchased it from if you're interested in the V1.1 hardware. Uh, but otherwise, if your 1.0 works for you, and if I'm being honest, aside from that terrible boot screen, like, I don't, I don't mind the deficiencies in this stuff. Of course, that still doesn't work. This specific cart doesn't work on these things unless you do that, but it does work. Um... Now I gotta know. It's probably the same thing here. Oh my god! They fixed it! What do you know? Oh, that is painful though. Uh... There we go. And one more thing while I'm at it. There is still quite a bit of buzz from the speaker, um, even when it's muted. I don't know if that's ever getting fixed. <laughs> Sorry, it is what it is. Uh, I compared it to the um, buzzing that an original Game Boy Color does in my GitHub repo, but it's, it's not the same noise. It's a different noise, but it's similar in nature, I guess. Uh, but anyway, before I ramble too much more, hey, that was only like eight minutes of rambling. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's all I've got. Super cool stuff. I'm super excited for the future of this stuff. And I, I can't, I can't wait for, for more, more hard, hardware. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, you can tell I've had enough. Anyway, I'll catch you all next time. Thanks for watching. Keep on being awesome. And I hope you have a fantastic 2024. Yeah. And, and, and beyond. I don't know.